I love those Holy Spirit moments when Edwin comes up here or Pastor Paris or anyone, and we realize we're just not here for a lecture. We just haven't had a worship concert. We're encountering the Lord, and He is at work. We're, we're into Holy Week beginning today. Palm Sunday launches the memory of Jesus heading towards His crucifixion and His resurrection that would unveil the identity and His full divinity, that He came not only just as the Son of Man, but He came as the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And He would open a pathway for all of us to change our identity from sinner to son, from sinner to saint. And today we want to talk about our God-given identity. On Friday night, a few of us cousins were having dinner with another cousin, and uh, we had an engaging time. Let me introduce you to him. Actually, he, he would have been here this morning. He's also the idol of Dr. Danny Yamashiro. They grew up in the faith together at Kalihi Union Church uh, when they were small. This is my cousin who grew up in Pearl City. Doc, this is General Michael Nagata. He is he retired recently as a three-star general with full authority over all the elite special forces in the United States military. He was given the assignment of creating a strategy in the Middle East that would dismantle ISIS, which was successful. It took three years. And I said, Michael, explain to me, explain to me what made the difference he said, we had to stop fighting for them, and we had to teach the Iraqis to fight for themselves. And the only way they could do that, Michael said, was they had to remember who they were, that they were the residents of their country. They were citizens of Iraq, and that ISIS, they were the invaders. And he said, Al-Qaeda was tough to fight. Al-Qaeda love to fight, ISIS love to die. And their goal was to die, which is why they were so difficult to contain. And so um, Michael said we had to teach them that they, they were the ones that were citizens of the country and they had to remember who they were and fight for what God put them on the planet for. And that's our introduction this morning. Sometimes challenges in life shake our confidence and we forget who we really are. We have to remember we are sons and daughters of the Most High God, and if we know Jesus, there's nothing that will change that. You're here this morning, and many will be here next week that never have come into a place of copying the identity of being a son and a daughter of God. So we, our opening text this morning is in Gospel of John, excuse me, 1 John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Behold, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. So what is the Holy Spirit speaking to us out of this passage? First of all, those who know the Lord are children of God. And if we've been, listen, if we've given our lives to Jesus, we then have been born into his family. Therefore, we are children of God. Think about that. So if we've been born again into the family of God and we receive the Lord as our personal Lord and Savior, we are in His family. And our God-given identity is not dependent on what we feel, but on the truth of what God says. Our identity is not shaped by the opinions of others and not what we've done in the past. But secondly, we are called to become like God. Say, like God. This is huge. We are called to become like God and express who we really are and ultimately who He really is, okay? Now, look at verse 2. Again, let's look at the text. Be beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, 
but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. So from the beginning, we were created, man was created to reflect the image and the glory of God. But the fall in the garden of Adam and Eve marred that visage. But when we are born again by faith, we receive Christ into our hearts, we are born again, all right, into the identity of being sons and daughters of God. And the Lord's main goal is to transform us into, into His image, to look like Him, and to really fully encompass the identity for which we are born. So if you know the Lord today and you sin, we all fall, we all sin. We're still being sanctified over time. It's a process. That doesn't mean we're sinners. We're just saints who happen to sin. It's different, right? Because you fall or fail doesn't make you a sinner. So I hear in conversation, oh, well, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm just a sinner. That actually is an incorrect statement. We have to be careful because what we say can shape what we do. What we say is a reflection of what we think, and it's impossible for a person to behave inconsistently to what he believes. So when we say that, I, I understand what we're saying. We're saying nobody's perfect. We're all flawed. We all fail from time to time. But we know, as we looked at last week, we can confess our sins, and our Savior is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is pro the, the provision of the blood. As children of God, we come to Him. Again, let me repeat, when we happen to sin, if we're born again, it's not that we're sinners, we're saints who are not yet perfect. But our fundamental core identity is we're sons and daughters of God. We are children of God. Now, this is a now reality, and the Apostle Paul expands on this in Ephesians chapter 2. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So think about that. Positionally, positionally, we are seated in a place of inherited authority with Christ in the heavenlies. And what God wants us to understand is He wants our experience to match our possession, our position. But that will never happen if the position of our thoughts say that we're sinners, say that we're not worthy, say that God holds our past against us. That's why when we started this series last week, we talked about this truth, Jesus changes our past. And I believe the Lord's heart aches for His people to assume their true identity. But before He came to save us and to cause us to sit in the heavenlies, He came to be with us in earthly prisons of sin. Kenny Tingsley and Anthony Holyfield forwarded me a video that I thought was rivetingly interesting, and I'm going to show it to you because it's about a judge who, like my cousin Michael, fought in Iraq... And I'm, by the way, I'm so proud of my cousin Michael. He's been in every most dangerous deployment ever. But I believe his faith has kept him sane. They were the first unit to deploy after 9-11. They gave him the hard jobs. And he was the first unit is to land on the ground and go hand-to-hand -hand combat, weapon-to-weapon -weapon with ISIS. And he's got stories upon stories. And if you don't know who you are in Christ, you could run out of fear. That's not who we are. Michael knew who he was. Obviously, this judge knew who he was. So take a look. Inside the county courthouse in Fayetteville, North Carolina, Judge Lou Oliveira made headlines with an unusual decision. You may be seated. A few years ago, Joe Cerna was arrested for drunk driving. As part of his probation, he wasn't allowed to drink. So when he lied about a recent urine test, the judge felt he had no choice. I gave Joe a night in jail because he had to be held accountable. It was just one night, but as he entered the cell, Joe says he knew it would be one of the longest nights of his life. When I walked into the jail cell and they closed the door behind me, I started feeling this um, anxiety. It came back? It came back, a flashback. 
Retired Army Sergeant First Class Joe Serna did three tours in Afghanistan and has two Purple Hearts to show for it. The Green Beret survived an IED and a suicide bomber. But he says his scariest moment was the night he was riding in a truck with three other soldiers. What happened? We were, we were following the, the creek, and uh, the road gave way. And um, the vehicle went into the creek. The truck started filling with water? Yeah. All hope was lost. Trapped and unable to move, Joe felt the water rising, past his legs, then waist and neck, until finally it stopped at his chin. How many guys got out of that truck? Alive? Yeah. Just me. I was a sole survivor. Joe says it still haunts him. So I suffer from PTSD. Among his issues, a fear of being in small, cramped places. I knew what Joe was going through, and I knew Joe's history, and he had to be held accountable, but I just felt I had to go with him. I, I felt I had to go with him. And so, a few minutes after Joe was locked up, Judge Lou Oliveira surprised the man he sent to jail by joining him for the entire night. We ate meatloaf, and uh, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about our families. And the walls got further apart? The walls just got, they, they, they didn't exist anymore. He brought me back to North Carolina from being in a truck in Afghanistan. That meant so much to me, sir. I know. This week, Joe promised the judge no more mess-ups. I don't want to let you down, ever. It's not how law and order usually works. But sometimes jail is not what a man needs. Sometimes the best sentence love you. I love you, is compassion. Thank you for breathing me. Steve Hartman, on the road, in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Okay, thank you, sir. And that's what Jesus had, compassion for us. He came to earth. He lived among us. Ultimately, he went one step beyond. He died for us. And Jesus, who one day will judge all of us, Christians unto rewards, the unbelievers into internal separation from God, Jesus went one step beyond. He set us free from our prisons, and he says, because I'll take your place. This judge had a bond with this soldier because this judge was also a soldier. And there was an identification. They had shared a common identity as brothers, brothers in battle. And my cousin will tell you there's no greater bond that will even challenge a marriage bond than brothers who fight at the risk of their lives together. Well, Jesus did that. And he, because he did that, he wants us to understand with a passion he wants us to understand who we really are so we can reflect who He really is to a world that needs to understand who God, what God is really like. And for that to happen, we have to assume our identity. Now, listen to this passage. The Apostle Paul expands in Ephesians chapter 1. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in heavenly places. Now, we are seated positionally now in heavenly places with an inheritance of grace, resources of power, and the authority of heaven. The problem is we don't use it because we forget who we really are. We think we're sinners, we think that's for a future day, but how are we going to reflect the beauty, the authority, the love, the power, and the presence of God if we don't lock into who we are now and express who He is and always has been? And that's a choice we make, not according to the opinion of others or how we feel or our past. That's a, that's a choice based on the truth of who God says we are. That's a choice. If you wait to feel it, you'll never do it. Everything's by faith. So we've inherited incredible authority and ability. And this is important because, as I said earlier, who we really are, who we think we really are in our thoughts will determine what we say and what we do. So 
I'll give you an example. We're, we're getting ready to move for the first time in 30 years. It's a lot of junk you accumulate in 30 years. And it's two homes. So we prune my, my parents. My father passed, as you know. My mother's now in a care facility and happy, by, I might add. Uh, we couldn't do it anymore after five years because of Alzheimer's and the surgery. She broke her femur. And so we were counseled, you've taken it as far as you can, and now it's the moment. Well, she has friends. She has company there. You need socialization. You need small group, right? And now when I visit her, she didn't want me to stay too long. She says, you need to get back to your family and live your life. She's 93. Governor Ige's uh, mother is there, and she's 100. So my mother's on the younger edge of that facility. But my mother remembers who she is. She may have forgotten a lot of things, but she remembers she's a Christian and she's a daughter of the Most High God. She remembers the Word of God. She remembers the things that are most important. She remembers that I'm her son, so the last thing that I do, and it's her birthday soon, is to pray for her. And that prayer somehow awakens a sense of gripping your identity. It's amazing. It connects you to God. But here's my point. I was reflecting on how we got this place. We bought it with my parents, knowing one day we would have to take care of them when they got older, and it worked perfectly. It's an it's a ideal uh, home where you have two homes side by side, and I could take two steps. I'm in, I'm in their home from my study into their kitchen. It's uniquely, um, it's uniquely designed. And so it has been so very good to us, so very good to us. But I remembered how we got the home. It was a battle. Because it was a, 30 years ago, it was a unique home and wonderfully, wonderfully designed by an architect who was also an engineer and he was very meticulous um, and very anal. So, which is great because my dad was anal. My dad was a craftsman. He could fix anything. He could build anything. And um, when we moved in, the problem was we couldn't own the property because it was lease. And in Hawaii, we didn't want to buy a lease. We felt the Lord told us to buy in fee simple. And so we had to make an appeal to a group of investors in Washington, D.C. to buy land from under the beautiful home that they did not want to sell. Here's, here's what I'm trying to say to you. Faye and I heard the Lord speak to us. This would be the home after, after seeing 50 homes. This would be the home. The year was 1992. And we were to buy the land. The problem was our realtor kept coming back and said, they don't want to sell the land, Norman, and I think we should move on. And I said, Danny, I don't think we should move on. I'm not an obstinate guy, but I'm pretty sure the Lord said, you need to contend for the land and own the land beneath the house. I said, Danny, can you go back one more time? He went back one more time, and then I remember he called, and he said, are you sitting down? And he said, they were, they were upset. Here's the question. What is it about your client that he doesn't understand the word no? Who does he think he is, and what does he do? He said, well, he's a Christian, and he's a minister. And they went, oh, you should have told us that in the first place. Uh, will sell, and in addition to that, the price dropped by $80,000. Now, the only reason I share that story is not that I'm anybody special. Faye and I did not move off that property because we felt like the Lord says He was going to give it to us if we contended for it, but we remembered who we were. We were not victims of investors who didn't want to sell. We were a, we were a son and daughter of the Most High God who owns all the land and the cattle, the book of Psalms says, on a, on a thousand hills. And I guess the question I'm asking is, I'm, I'm asking myself this question as we move forward and reflect on the past. What has God wanted to give to us because we're His, but we never receive because we've never contended for it? Because even the Israelites had to fight to enter the promised land that was given to them because they were his people. And I believe we're moving forward in situations like this 
where we have to constantly remember in the battles of life, remember who we are. Right, the classic movie, The Lion King, right? Remember who you are. Okay. Now, our cooperation will lead to our sanctification. I'm going someplace with this. Verse 3, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, why is this important? The Lord is bringing us to a place where he will return soon. And soon is relative when it comes to the Lord. Most people believe we could be living in the generation where Jesus Christ comes again. It's known as the parousia, the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ. But Scripture says clearly everyone who thus hopes in Him or has this hopes purifies himself as pure. Now, this is first a command. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16, we read, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who, is, who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Wow, that's heavy. God is saying, be holy. You know, somehow we get, I don't know about you, I get a little intimidated. That's a command, be holy. Well, we can't make ourselves holy, but God can make us holy because that's His will. He wants to move us into a place of constant sanctification, purification, and cleansing so we look just like Jesus. That's not something we can work up. That's something God has to work in. And so, we should allow God, therefore, full access to our hearts so He can cleanse our hearts because only He can do that. Remember, He, he will do anything and everything to shape us in His image. And Here's what Jesus said about that. He said, blessed are the pure in heart there in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, for they shall see God. That's the goal. See, when we come to this place, if we're alive on this earth and Jesus comes, the second coming of Christ, we have to understand that if we hope to meet Jesus in the air, okay, upon his return, we have to allow him to cleanse us on earth before he returns. There is a wrong teaching out there that says when the Lord returns, all who believe will be caught up with Him. That's wrong. Scripture repeatedly teaches all who are ready, all who are ready, those who have, been pre who have prepared. Scripture is very clear. There has to be a total work of sanctification and purification if we are to meet the Lord in the air and perhaps miss the most tribulating part of world history. So easy believism of everybody just say, I believe in Jesus, yeah, bro, and you're living differently with no conviction and no desire to change. Scripture is clear about many who think they're going to be ready, but they won't be ready. And hence the movie Left Behind. See, we live in a day where if we grab our identity, we have to let him work in our humanity to bring, her, bring us closer to the image of his divinity. And we just can't live and say, oh, that's just me, and then say, well, everybody else does it, so I'll just be me. I gotta be me, right? No, that's not God's call for us. God's call is to change me to look like him. And that means we give him access into every part of our soul. The power and initiative is from God, but the response is on us. Does that make sense to you? It's saying, Lord, I give you permission. So the more we access his presence, the more he changes us into his likeness, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And as we put our hope in Him, His power frees us over time and transforms us. How do we be behold Him? We behold Him in worship. We behold him by taking the word of God in that brings a cleansing and a change on a regular basis. Relationships in small groups, prayer. These things, these spiritual disciplines engage constantly, consistently, and regularly over time. We may not feel it in the moment, but we are gradually transformed. 
as people pray for us, as we interact with people in group and discipleship, as we take the Word of God, the supernatural Word of God, and that Word cleanses, refines, and purifies us, the book of Psalms says. So to the degree that we engage the spiritual disciplines of life, to that degree the Lord will work in us to prepare us for His return. And coming out of this pandemic, God's left enough urgency on the planet for us to realize we really need Him. We desperately need Him. And that's what pushes us into Scripture, pushes us into worship, pushes us into prayer, and pushes us into small group discipleship. So important. We don't change in a vacuum. We change in a community. We change by engaging the clear things God calls us to. And that's where we encounter His power. And He will finish. We'll finish with this today. He will finish His work in us when He returns. Verse 2. We go back. We know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. We're on the earth. Here comes Jesus. And there's this marriage, the wedding, the joining at His return with His now prepared church. Will we be ready? How we live now determines that. Remember, the theology that says everybody who believes in Jesus will be caught up in the air is not true. There are many views of eschatology and the end times, but one clear theme is this. Jesus is coming in for a purely cleansed, sold-out church, not an unprepared bride. And so the preparation we make, because Jesus is the groom, the church is the bride, is as intense and thorough as a bride on earth prepares for her wedding day. And that's pretty intense. As far as I can tell, I've done a lot of weddings. I married a wife. That's a lot of preparation. Too much preparation, actually, sometimes I thought to myself, okay? Now, here's the wedding. Watch this. In in Revelation chapter 19, in the whole panorama of that apocalyptic book, it's the 19th chapter that the wedding, or the, or the wedding of Jesus to his church concludes. The work of the ages has been finished, and we read how it looks like. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride, that's the church, has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. This is the wedding. This is the marriage moment. So you get that. But after that, there will be a marriage supper celebration. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb, okay, after Christ's return. But the preparation for entry into the marriage supper of the Lamb, entry into the marriage precedes his return. That's where we live now. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse us, we more resemble and take on the fullness of the identity he's called us into. Now, I remember 43 years ago. Was it 43? I forget. 42? 43. Somewhere around there. 1980. What year is this? 222. Okay, 42 years ago. There was a lot of preparation as to who we were going to invite to the wedding, and then who could be invited to the marriage supper of the Nakanishis. Why? There's a limited capacity in the hall, and there's a limited budget. And that was arduous, because you've got to pick some, and you can't pick others. You can't invite everybody, which is what we wanted to do. So you have this intense selection process, with God, he invites everybody. It's an open invitation. There's no capacity limit. He invites everybody. And everybody, therefore, should get ready. He wants everybody to prepare. But the truth of it is, not everyone will respond. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, and this is where we bring it down to a head here, this morning, we are given a glimpse through Jesus describing a parable of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's also found in other Gospels, but let's take the one from Luke 14. 
A man once gave a great banquet, Jesus said, and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. I want you to listen to this. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. This relates to real estate, house, property, and possessions. These are the kinds of things that can keep people from God. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Oxen in an agricultural society was the beast of occupation and labor. This relates to employment, your job, your business in principle. How often do we use that as an excuse of why we can't engage the Lord? Familiar? We're all flawed, right? I don't have time. Okay, another said, I have married a wife. Oh, that's a kicker. <laughs> and therefore, I cannot come. Sometimes romance and relationships, and we say, well, it's because of family matters. You know, I can't be in church. I can't serve. I can't reach out. Jesus is not going to take those as excuses, folks. And this is not a beat-down message. I'm just letting the Word of God speak to us right here today. Because you got a lot of people using the pandemic as a I got to catch up on life. I got to go to Disney World. I got to take care of my family. I got to get my business back up. Right. That is true. That is right on. But you're going to do it without God. Good luck. Because He is the source of everything. He is the source of all provision and, uh, and success. We should never, ever forget that. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, obviously being the Lord, became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to his servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. What was Jesus teaching his disciples? If we are part of the family, we need to do everything we can to invite the lost into God's family. When we really grasp our identity, it's not just knowing the Lord for ourselves. We have to have a great compassion and concern for others, just like Judge Oliver, whose concern was to connect with this fellow soldier, combat brother in arms, to make sure he wouldn't take, he wouldn't take his life or he wouldn't stress in a cell because of the PTSD issues of everything he'd gone through. And there's somebody out there you need to be with. You and I need to be with as we head to Easter next week. You and I have, we have someone, someone someplace in your life circle is saying, invite me, be with me. Because I'm in a prison, but I'm not going to go tell anybody about it. But you know who they are. They've flashed hints to you. You know, you've sensed, they've been on your mind, you've been praying for them. How are they doing? How are they re you've Zoomed them, you've FaceTimed. It's time to be with them in person. And most people, if they're invited, will come. It's true. And now more than ever, we need to explode into Easter and fill the house and compel them to come in. If we are believers and carry the family name of Jesus Christ, we need to break off all fear and remember who we are. That we have Jesus not just for ourselves. We have Jesus to share with others so they can become part of God's family. And there's no season in history that people are more open other than Easter. Next week... I adjure you as senior and founding pastor, let's fill this service. Do not come alone. Uh, yeah, how about a better amen? amen? Let's go. It's coach time here. Okay? Remember who you are. You are sons and daughters of the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And there's many people who through us will receive invitations, not only to the wedding, but into the marriage supper of the Lamb. This past Tuesday, I got to spend some time with Timmy Chang, who is the current University of Hawaii football coach. Show you a real picture there, and that's a little dark because like 
started talking to him when it was dark because they practice in the morning. And we were talking leadership principles, turning the program around, and all these kinds of things. But he shared something that was really interesting. He says, you know, the most effective people in, of inviting people, potential players and brothers in the brotherhood, into the program, into the experience of warrior football is not the coaches. It's the players. It's the players on the field themselves. It's even the public. It's not everybody thinks it's on us to recruit, and that's important. But he says the most effective recruiters and inviters are the ones who are on the field. You are on the field. And I went, that was so cool because I've never looked at it that way before. Revivals and awakenings in history have always depended on every believer in life making it their responsibility to take the gospel and have the guts and the courage and the compassion to share it with lost people. Remember who you are. Do not come alone. And by the way, come church even if you don't have anybody next week, okay? Don't go, I shame so up because I don't want nobody, bro. I'm going to Zoom. I'm going to Zoom. Stop that. You got somebody. This week, pray, who can I bring? Who can I invite? And let's make it. I want you to look at the empty seats. Just look at the empty yeah, seats. Actually, move your body. Look at the empty seats. There's too many empty seats. You know what they say about the 730 service? They're old. They don't have much of a people pool. They don't have no energy. They just think about themselves. And the young people say, we get them, bro. This is my service. Let's show them up. Right? That's a little carnal. That's a little football bravado here today. Hey, look, if you're here and this is your service, take pride in it and fill the house. Because soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Right? See, I got some pop in me. <laughs> you grew up with Joplin and Hendrix and Buddy Miles and Santana and Three Dog Night and Cold Blood. You know what I'm saying? Ike and Tina Turner. You got pop in you. You got energy in you. Next week, let's fill the house. You up there. Yes, I'm talking to you. Do not come alone because soon and very soon he's coming and the preparation begins now. Can I hear an amen in the house? Sorry. That's what happens when you get to, you get to talk to a three-star general, right, who, who talks about, hey, look, we just got to be who we are. And then Coach Chang, who's it's just kind of got that little bit of soldier football coach in me as a close today. But, man, I don't want to miss our Super Bowl moment next week. And I don't know about you. Very few people watch the Super Bowl by themselves. Let's not be that. Father, show us who it is that we can invite. Lord, to the rehearsal of your wedding and your marriage supper. We read in your word, you compelled. You, you, you said, no, it's not enough. Go back out. Go back out. Go again. Go again. And bring them in. We know that it's not works on our part. But we do know you've prepared people to invite because the most effective inviters into the experience of your family is the people on the ground, all of us working together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.